so what we're going to do is we're going to do a little slideshow here about black and white. It's very basic. And then we're going to process together. And we're going to do the processing in Lightroom and then Nick's software. Uh, just so for a show of hands real quick for me, how many people use Lightroom here? Perfect. How many people use Nick's software? OK, good. So that should be a good, uh, a good group to work with. Now, my background's in newspapers. Um, grew up in the newspaper industry. Um, small town newspapers in northern Michigan, so that's kind of my background. I live in uh, Chicago now with Stacy, and uh, we do workshops, and I've authored uh, quite a few books in the last few years. Uh, these are some of the titles. Uh, I think it's been a total of six books and a couple of DVDs within about a four-year period, somewhere right around there. Um, so it's been a pretty steady, steady clip, especially for a guy who doesn't enjoy writing that much. So. <laughs> um, and then we do workshops. Uh, we only do a few workshops. We do them in uh, New Orleans, uh, of course, in Chicago, where we're based out of. Uh, New York City, we do a workshop in the fall. Uh, Death Valley, Yellowstone, Italy. And uh, we always do small groups. We never do big groups. About six people usually is all are allowed to attend, so I can work with each person one-on-one. -on -one. And that's a little bit about our, our model. And then I train a lot on, on Lightroom in Chicago. Uh, so we're going to be covering black and white uh, photography. Now, I, I love black and white photography, um, probably because of my newspaper background is my guess. I'm just used to seeing things in black and white. Um, you know, to get color in, the, in a newspaper back in the day was very expensive. So you, you always had a black and white uh, paper in our hometown. So I'm just, I was just used to it. And so I, have, I just have a natural tendency to look for things in black and white. And I'll talk a little bit about that process that t takes place when I'm looking at an image. Um, this image right here is actually off of a, a Leica monochrome with a yellow fl filter on it. Um, and I shoot uh, with Canon and Leica, a little bit with the D7000 or 7200. But primarily, um, the kit that I use on a regular basis is a Canon uh, 5D Mark III and a Leica system, M9 or the monochrome. That's basically or an M6. So that's basically the kit that I use. Um, I know there's always questions about that. And we're doing 101, intent, you know, 101 uh, shades of gray, kind of a play on the new movie. And because the, in, in gray, there's about 101 intensities. So it's kind of a play on words for those of you. So um, we know the concept. There's nothing worse than a sharp image of a fuzzy concept. So the one thing we talk about a lot when we're teaching photography is really when you're out, just be intentional with whatever you're doing. Uh, I do this whole series. It's called the, uh, as you'll notice, it says, from snapshots to great shots. And really, the, the whole idea behind the whole thing is we want to take a snapshot, just a shot that you take, and we want to make it a great shot. And for me, the dividing line for that in many cases is just intention. You've thought about it. You're thinking about that image, what you're trying to achieve versus just pointing out your camera and taking a shot. And, uh, and it goes into, into the framing and into when I took this image, for instance, uh, I knew I was going to, how I was going to process it. That was going into to the whole composition of this, how I was going to process this particular image and, and bring the texture out and the sand, uh, add contrast to the sky. So. If there's one thing you can take away from this whole process, I hope, is that we really focus on whatever we do, it's intentional um, when we're creating that image. Um, black and white uh, in a color world, uh, things we're going to really need to pay attention is we're doing a lot of conversion nowadays of color images. And uh, the hue, of course, uh, like red, um, when we're manipulating the colors, and the saturation is really going to be key for creating that contrast. As you can see from this upcoming slide, I'll show you how color is really just a, a key factor in manipulating an image and making it a really great black and white image. Uh, so as you see from this color slider here, you'll notice that as a color uh, saturation increase, the contrast between the black and the white does. And this is a good example here with the dark red versus uh, the light red. Uh, you'll notice that the dark red has a lot of contrast versus the light reds. And with a very low contrast um, with the light blue versus a light red. So when you're looking at an image, you're just even in the color image that you're thinking about, hey, I, I'm, I may convert this to black and white. You want to see a lot of contrast. So if you have a very vibrant blue or a very vibrant red, let's say they're flowers, they're, they're mid-tone wise, they're going to be exactly the same. 
So you really need that light and dark. That's what we're looking for when looking at an image is the light and the dark to make a really nice contrasty image in black and white. And of course, composition is a big piece. Um, I'm a big guy for symmetry. I don't know why. I just have a tendency to always look for things that are symmetrical. Uh, probably because there's so much chaos in my life, I guess. I, I look for it in, the, in my images. Uh, and so when we take the color out of an image, really what we're left with is the composition. Uh, you know, for a lot of people, they see a face in this uh, particular image. Um, some people just see the lines, kind of a classic line shot. But whatever it is, when you get rid of that color, the composition really needs to stand on its own. Um, and that's a huge uh, goal of mine when I'm creating an image. And of course, with you know, without light, we don't have anything. And really, for any strong black and white, we need to have the light dancing in some form or fashion. In this particular case, this was a Maasai warrior um, that was showing the traditional techniques of starting a fire. And uh, we were in one of their huts. I was sitting on a, uh, I was sitting on a tire actually. And it was very close quarters, but we just had the natural light coming in from the door that really helped illuminate. No flash. I don't work with a flash very often, if at all. I, I personally, probably because I don't know how to use the darn thing. But I, you know, anyway, I, that's what that's the truth story. But uh, I like to work with natural light uh, on a regular basis. Um, and during. And I like shadows a lot. And a lot of people during the high afternoon sun, they, they go and they hide. You know, I'm only going to photograph during the, the best hours. That's what they think about. What is the best time to photograph? Well, it's going to be late at night. It's going to be, you know, early in the day. Well, I like going out in the afternoon and chasing the shadows, a harsh, contrasty light. And this image is a, is a decent image in color, but for me, it really spoke to me in black and white. And the fact that we have. Uh, the human form in there as well kind of adds this piece, and this was shot um, in in Italy. And so, anytime you know, I can find some nice lines uh, or find some shade from the sun where it's casting some nice shadows, I'll look for that when I'm traveling. This is the Vatican uh, staircase looking up, shot with a wide angle. Um, once again, we'll process this image, I believe, uh, coming up here. And you can kind of take a look at Some people are going to like it in color. Some like it in black and white. I prefer it in black and white. Um, but what was interesting with this shot is once you really eliminated the color, the form really stuck out for me. And that's what I look for when I'm converting to black and white. I ask myself that question all the time. What, what's going to happen when I desaturate this image? Uh, you know, what is it, what's the feeling I'm looking for? And I like darker images on a regular basis. I would say, for the most part, I like a little darker image. Um, and I just, this, I felt this image more than I did the color version. The color version is very warm, and you'll see that. Uh, contrast, of course, uh, I always look for. In this particular case, uh, we had a, a fog bank that had moved in, nearby part, in a nearby park. I was on the roof clearing ice. <laughs> We had water coming in through our ceiling. So I was up on the roof, and I look out in this park, and I see, I see this, uh, this fog bank coming in. I said, my gosh. So I got down off the roof. I told Stacy, the roof's going to have to leak. We're, I'm going to go get this shot. I grabbed my bag. I'm running down there. And as you can see, I shot this, I think, at a 25th of a second. And this is kind of earlier in my career, too. And it, it was just it was one of those shots that I still love it to this day because it's very, you know, it's a little mystery behind it, the footprints and all the rest. And, but it's very high contrast, as you can see. Um, and that's another thing I look for shots when we're converting something to black and white. It just it definitely was a black and white shot and not a color shot. Of course, you guys are familiar with this one. You've seen it a bunch. Those of you here in New York, uh, and this is just a classic use of lines. Um, and we shot this at high noon, I think, or pretty close. No, I'm sorry, it was in the morning. We shot this, and uh, it's just a it's a beautiful sight. It's classic. It's got a lot of very interesting lines going on, converging lines. Uh, you know, it has a lot going on, so it's a classic example. So anytime I have a lot of lines, I'll convert to black and white, and you'll see that when we're processing a little later. Uh, another thing I look for in my image, and this has some texture. It has in the wood. It, it has a little bit in the railing and stuff. But I like texture a lot. 
and uh, this is on Amboseli. That's Kilimanjaro off in the distance. And it's kind of funny. I went to I went there years later. I, I hiked Kilimanjaro. You know, climbed it. It's not a technical climb. It's more of a very tough hike. Um, and then we never saw the top. So it wasn't until I came back years later for photography that I actually finally saw the top of Kilimanjaro and the snow. Um, and I, I love this shot because of the texture that you see be, behind the smooth uh, sky. So the foreground has all this texture, and then the background and the sky is very smooth. So I like that contrast as well. Um, so the, inevitably the goal is when we're taking our shot and we're being intentional and we're, we're thinking about it is you know, what am I going to do with the shot? How am I going to process it? And knowing what you can do with the software helps. I mean, you want to get as much right in camera hands down, without a doubt. But you also need to know what techniques are available to you uh, in the dark room or in the digital dark room, as we're going to do here. And knowing what those techniques are really helps you, I think, uh, put together the image you really env envision, if you will. It, like, for instance, when I shot this shot, I knew I was going to add clarity to the foreground to bring out the contrast, and I'll show you how that works. I knew, I knew I'd probably use a graduated filter at the top to darken a little bit because I didn't have a filter on me at the time. There's just little techniques I knew I was going to do, so when I was getting the shot, it was more about just getting the composition down as much as possible and the exposure correct, and then later on, uh, making those adjustments to make that vision come to life for me. And that's really uh, what the case is. It's just thinking the whole process through, um, what, what your capabilities are in, in Lightroom or Photoshop or whatever you use, and then how can I frame that shot to take, make the most of it? And that's really the goal. One of the things I want to talk about, and we're going to spend a lot of time in Lightroom, uh, and you guys mentioned that you're in Lightroom. Now, first of all, just as a setup technique uh, for those of you that use Lightroom a lot, uh, have you ever noticed some people will have, I mean, I, I did early on, you'll have all these open and you can't toggle through them. A technique that I like to use is solo mode, if you're not familiar with it. So you come over on the right-hand side here, you right-click, and you turn on solo mode. It's off right now, and I'll show you. When it's off, you have to kind of drill through these, you know, and they don't collapse. If you have it on, it'll collapse when you're in the particular tool that you want to use. So you're only looking at the tools that you're using. So that's a helpful tip uh, when using Lightroom. And you can set them up for each of the panels. Uh, one of the tools I like to use a lot for black and white is Clarity. Clarity adds uh, contrast to the midtones. Uh, and you'll notice this is a classic midtone. And we can see that from the histogram here. This is just a classic midtone shot. Uh, just a big hump there right in the midtones. But if you want to add a little bit of contrast in the midtones. I just want you to watch this shot of the cloud here. We move it to the right. Notice how that adds a lot of contrast. See that? So this is one of the techniques I want to show you. And we're going to, we're going to do a couple quick techniques, and then we'll process images together. But this is a good display of what clarity can do. Now, too far to the right on a color shot with clarity, it'll make it look like HDR, actually. Uh, and black and white, it can look funky too. So it has to be the right shot. You don't want to go, go too far to the right with clarity. It's like anything. You take it to the point that it doesn't look real and you back it off. That's the technique. But it adds, the point of this is it adds a lot of contrast into the midtones. So that's the one thing off the bat that I do with a lot of my images. Uh, the second thing we can do right off the bat is look at the tone curve. So by default, Lightroom uses a linear tone curve. There are points that we can use right here. And often, I'll go to a medium contrast. See the difference there? Or a strong contrast. There are some people, and there are some images, that you may just want to process right in the tone curve and I can use a basic panel. And that's fine, and we can do one of those together. But the point is, off, the two things I like to do immediately uh, is really bump up the clarity on my image, if, especially if it's got a lot of midtones or to it, and then come to the tone curve before I even start processing it. And at the very least, set the point curve to medium. And then what we can do with the tone curve, to give you a good example, is we can use the sliders here to make adjustments to it. 
we can increase the highlight brightness. See that? Can decrease it. Same with the lights. And the region that you see right here, this region is being affected as we're moving that. Or we can decrease them. Or if you're not quite sure what you want to do, you can use what I call the target tool over here. And you just grab it, select it, and come over to the area that you want to either increase or decrease in the tone curve. It's very helpful. And you'll notice over on the tone curve here, you'll see it's moving around on the line. You see that? That's where it is represented on the, line, on the, on the tone curve line. So this kind of in the middle towards the midpoint and we'll grab, let's say, a highlight here. And you can select, and just using your arrow keys on your keyboard, go up, that, or down. Very easy way to do it. So we'll pull this together in another image here, but that's the basic real quick tutorial on how we're going to use the tone curve and use clarity. Now, the other thing I like to use for a color conversion is using the color sliders. And it's a very powerful technique, both available in Lightroom and in Nick's software. And so we'll take a look at this image. I'm not going to do the tone curve right now for this. So we're going to come right to black and white conversion in the HSL panel and select it. And you'll notice off the bat we get a black and white mix that's set up or should be set up in Lightroom to automatically adjust the colors. And we're going to have the ability to use these sliders here. Now, we know the sky is blue, correct? So if we want to darken the sky, right at that, just using that color channel, creates a much more dynamic look. And we know that the sand here was probably uh, yellow, is my guess. We'll go like that. If we want, or we can brighten it. Once again, we have the tool here available to us to drop over in the sky and go up and down the aerials, either to lighten it or to darken it. See how it's affecting the two blues a little bit? or even the water. That's affecting yeah, both of them a little bit more. So this is another technique that I'll use. And when you try to pull these together, really using when I'm doing a, doing a conversion to black and white from color, using the tone curve, clarity slider off the bat, and using these color sliders. Uh, very effective uh, tool. So that's really just a quick uh, showdown. There's one last step I want to do. It's a cleanup step. That when we're done with all this, what I want you to do is I want you to check your images for spot removal. So we're going to come up here in the spot removal. We're going to look for spots, any little turn on the visual spots. So we come up here, we turn on spot removal, turn on visual spots, and then we can use this kind of like a mask to kind of view any little spots that we have. I need to reset that. There we go. Any little spots that we have. And you'll see this is dust right there, and we'll remove the dust. Turn that back on, make the brush a little bigger, and just clean up any little dust that we have in the sky. Because as you're working your images and converting them to black and white, dust isn't always apparent when it's in color, but definitely when you convert it to black and white, it gets very contrasty, you're going to see the dust. So this is a good cleanup uh, process to go through at the very end. You can do it in the beginning, um, but I find that some computers, depending on what they have and the model that they are and the rest, struggle with Lightroom 5 and it slows them down. So at, the, at least at the very end, I would do this process. It really depends on how fast your system is, how much RAM you have, and the rest. It's just like a lens correction. If you do a lens correction, typically it's best to do it in the beginning. But if it slows your computer down, I recommend doing it at the end. And so that cleans up those dust spots that are here. So those are the three things we kind of do. And we're going to pull together an image now and do it together. So this is that shot that we convert to black and white. And I'm going to run through this with you guys just the way I would do it. So I'd come over, and we're going to start off. We're going to be in the black and white. And I'm going to go to black and white like that. And because this had a lot of yellow in it, I'm going to dial the yellow down. See the difference? And it has a little orange as well. See right in there? <coughs> But I want the staircase to make sure I can still see the tone on the staircase. So I'm going to lighten that a little bit. A little bit of red, I think, in it. 
the browns. Okay. And then we're going to head up to the tone curve. Got really dark there. So we went to a medium contrast point. I grabbed the lights, bring it up a little bit, highlights a little bit. And now we have that kind of classic S curve, if you see. And if we want, now down here, this is the midpoint on the curve. We can move this if we want to compress the shadows, give more room to the lights. See that how it lightens it up? Or vice versa, if we want to compress the highlights, move it to the right, and it actually deepens the shadows just by moving it around. It's kind of an advanced technique using these splits. Then back up to the basic panel, let's add a little clarity. See what that did to the mid-tone area? Popped it a little bit. And so there's, there's probably, there's a little bit of highlight recovery here that I'd probably do to bring that back in. And we could do that a number of ways. We could use a highlight slider here to bring the highlights back in. That works pretty well. And that probably would do the job just fine. And you see that where it is? It's these blown out highlights. We're losing some of the detail. You can turn it on. Right here, that turns it on so we can see it. And if we move the highlight to the left, it gets rid of it. And that probably does a pretty good job. Another technique, if we didn't want to apply it to the image as a whole, is we'd grab the radio filter, create a circle right there. I think this is already inverted. It is inverted. Normally, by default, it's, it's uh, not inverted, the mask isn't. So basically how it works is everything outside of that circle is going to be affected. But in this case, we want to invert it. Just send these back to default. And we could actually use this to apply it, just like that. So now it's just affecting this region. But I think in this particular case, that was a good demo, but in this particular case, we would just use a highlight because I want to retain the highlights in this area as well. They're blown out. So we're going to move that a little bit. So that'd probably be it for me, except for there's one last step that I want to do, and that's sharpening. Um, sharpening is a, bit, is a process I do quite a bit, um, and it's really evolved over time. But I don't think people uh, spend enough time on sharpening. So what I'll do is, so the sharpening by default is at 25. This is their pre-sharpening, 25. The radius, which is... Uh, around the edge, how thick the edge is. That's the radius that we're looking at. The detail, of course, is how much detail is in that radius. So by default, those are generally pretty good. Um, but I'll, I'm going to increase the amount of sharpening. And we can use this tool to kind of put it on something like that. And then what I'm going to do is use masking. Because there's no sense to sharpen black. There's no point to it. So what you do is you're going to Select the masking. You're going to hold down the Alt Option key and start moving it to the right. And our eyes perceive things, sharpness, by the outline, right? That's how we perceive sharpness. So we are basically going to turn off the masking on things that we don't need to be sharp, which is, in this case, the black. There's no point to it. And that would be how I apply selective sharpening in Lightroom. And that would probably be it for that shot. So now I'm going to head over. This is kind of a, just one of those shots. I think it was in San Francisco. And I really liked, once again, I'm looking for light and dark and just what was taking place here with the staircase and the rest. And we're going to take this one into Nick. Now, with Nick, what you can do is I recommend making adjustments that you want with this image. I've already done that if there are any little dust spots and stuff ahead of time. And then you're going to export it out into Nick's software. In that case, we're going to do a right click. And we'll edit with a copy of the Lightroom adjustments. It's going to create a TIFF file. It's going to open up. Get this so you guys can see it. up the panel here. 
and this is the preset library. So on the left-hand side here, these are all the presets that come with Nick. They're all pretty handy. They do, they do a really interesting job. Uh, I used to use uh, high contrast smooth quite a bit. And we can see just be the before and after effect with that. Pretty interesting. In order to see the before and after, you have to have one of these comparison states selected up here. But by default, yours may be just in the single view. But I like to use this right here and just take the slider back and forth and take a look at what's taking place. So these are presets, just like in Lightroom. Same concept. You're using a preset that once you click on it, it's done some global adjustments here on the right-hand side and set these uh, sliders. Um, you can also have custom presets that you've created. These are, oops. <coughs> these are custom presets that I've used throughout the years. And I'm going to start with one of these. I'm going to start with one that mimics film called Film One. And I'll use these as a jumping off spot. We're not necessarily going to just click and be done, but sometimes that's all how it works. Instead, I'm just going to use this as a beginning point for the rest of the editing. And what I like to do is take a look at the global and the structure. The thing with structure, much like clarity when you use it, it adds a lot of contrast, but also can create noise. So you have to be kind of careful with it. Um, but this looks, this setting looks pretty good. I'm going to grab, and this is really the, the real strong suit of Nick, and probably the reason I still use it to this day, are the control points. So I'm going to select a control point. I'm going to put it right here on this window. It's a little dark for me. I'm going to create a boundary circle, what I call a boundary circle, kind of an area that's going to be affected is inside that circle, much like the radio filter in Lightroom. And now we have these features that we can use to adjust that image. So in this case, I'm going to just brighten it up a little bit. And if you're curious what area you know, is being affected, what you can do is you can come over here, select this box, and it'll show you the mask of the area that's being affected. So this area is what's being affected during the processing. Now, this area in the gray here is being affected, too. It's what I kind of call spillover, if you will. And you can neutralize that. I call it a neutral control point. I think Nick calls it an anchor control point. You just select a control point and drop it there, and it kind of neutralizes the effect. We haven't made any adjustments with this control point, but just helping refine this control point further. And we can drop another one if we want, just to make sure that there's no spillover effect. So here we go. So I'm just going to brighten this up a little bit, and I'll probably do that with maybe by desaturating the blacks a little bit here. And you'll find what I do with images on a regular basis. I, I just take little parts of them, and I, and I do little small adjustments. It's not about making huge adjustments with the image. It's just looking at the little things that I want to make a little different with them, just picking it apart, if you will. Uh, and we can use the red slider here. This was like a stain. And if you're ever curious to look like, I can't quite remember what this was, what the original image looked like, because it comes in grayscale, right? You can come down to the history panel here. There we go. We move the history. So under history slider here, we move it to original image. And now we can look at what the original image looked like. And we know that this is orange. So if we move this slider, it's kind of an orange, red, yellow. So let's move the yellow. See how that lightens or darkens it? See that effect? Same concept in, that we have available to us in, uh, in Lightroom. Now you may be wondering, why do you use this program versus Lightroom? And they're just different. Um, it really depends on the image. I go back and forth on which program I want to use. Uh, Lightroom's algorithm is a little different, works on some images a little better, I would say. And uh, like, for instance, if I have a filter, I'm actually using a film filter on front of my camera, like a 10-stop uh, or a 3-stop. For whatever reason, I think the algorithm in Lightroom handles that gradient a little better um, when it converts it. Now, when it comes to just flat out converting a black and white image, uh, Nick does a really nice job. Their algor algorithm is very nice. Um, so it really depends on the image. And we can make, so that's where we can use the colors once again to kind of make adjustments however we want to. Now let's say I want to make this a little darker, this region right in here. 
I can go to another control point, select it, we're going to make it a little larger, and it may have some spillover on these windows, but we're actually just going to take and make it a little darker like that. So that darkens it. And then I can add a little bit of structure to this to make it grittier. See that? The lines become very defined. That's what structure is doing. Very similar to clarity. Now let's say I'm happy with this. This image, I, you know, I'm okay with it. Um, it. It's good and I want to create a preset for this. Then all we need to do is we're going to go in and click this right up here under custom. We'll call this BNH preset and hit OK. And this will be available to us in the future that we can use anytime we want on any image as a starting point. And if you decide that, you know, I'm going to make, it's not going to keep the control points, by the way. Those obviously are particularly the, that image. But it's going to keep all the general adjustments here. And if you decide you want to make an adjustment, let's say we want to make an overall um, soft contrast adjustment like that, we can always come back to the preset and update it. Clicking here and hit yes, update. And it gets updated. So that's how you would update a preset. Now, for those of you who have NIC presets, I highly recommend uh, any of your presets actually, but uh, NIC, export them all out, save them to something else. Uh, on occasion, I get a lot of emails from people, they lose their presets during an update and it turns into a hassle. So always back them up on something. They're very small files. Um, let me hit save. And this will save it back into Lightroom. And I'll stack it next to your original image. So there we go. Stacked right next to it. So let's take this one and reset it. Pretty flat off the bat. And you'll notice, so we have the red of his shirt that we can use. We can darken it. See that? I'm actually going to make it, I think, a little brighter. That's the only adjustment I'm going to do right here. I'm actually going to go back up into the basics panel in this case, and I'm going to add a little clarity. And I'm going to add a little black into this image. I find for whatever reason, um, my Canon, I end up always adding black back into it. And you may find that with a lot of your digitals, yeah, you have to add black back into it. It's kind of a normal process. Uh, with my Leica, I don't have that problem. And I add a medium contrast curve. I'm going to deepen the shadows a little bit more. But I'm going to bring out the highlights. But what I don't like what's happening here is I'm losing a little bit of the detail. I'd like to have a little more structure in here. I'm going to show you that how I'll handle that in a second. That's pretty good for me on that level. So we'll go to the radio filter. Take the radio filter. I'm going to put it right over the smoke. And the radio filter always goes back to kind of the last thing you did with it. I'm going to invert it. It is inverted, and I'm going to just use clarity and watch what happens. See that? But it's just affecting the smoke there. And let's see what contrast does for us. A little bit of contrast there. And because it is highlights, we can make them really bright if we want, like this. But in this case, I think I'm going to bring them down just a little bit so that we have the detail there. Now, you notice I haven't spent a lot of time in the basics panel. It's just very subtle adjustments. But on occasion, uh, I do have to work in the basics panel. And more than likely, it's an exposure adjustment or something of that nature that I'll be using it for. Uh, I don't use a contrast slider very often. If I do, I actually use, uh, I make those adjustments with the whites and the blacks. I rarely use the contrast slider. Uh, another no-no when you're doing color, as far as I'm concerned, is 
We don't have it here, but you don't use the saturation slider very often. We use a vibrant slider. Um, I can talk about that later. And then for details, once again, we come in, we do some sharpening. I'll put it on his hands. Increase the sharpening a little bit. And this gives us a one-to-one -one view. If you don't see this, if you get this little question mark here or exclamation mark, that means that you need, need to be at a one-to-one -one view. I want you to generate that. So that's why you get that. So you can either, so what you can do is you can either click on it and it'll go to a one-to-one -one view or you, um, you zoom in here over on the screen over here. So if we're at fit, you just have to go to one-to-one -one over here and move it around if you want. Just want you at a one-to-one -one view. That's why you get that there. So what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to once again do some masking. Alt option. Probably right around there. And I'm going to do, so I'm, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to add sharpening just to the image as a whole. But I'm going to go back in now. And I want to add a little more sharpening just to his hand region here, just to right here, because it's kind of the focus point for me of this image. So I'm going to use the radio filter for this. And we're going to create another radio filter right here, put on his hands. And I'm just going to sharpen this a little bit here. And if you want to look at your stuff, uh, you know, this is kind of hard to see, but if you want to look at full view, you just hit F on your keyboard so you can kind of take a look at things, um, see a full size, so you have a good idea what you're doing, how the image looks. And like I said, we have a lot of contrast. This, where the, this really where it boils into um, what, what you are thinking in your head as far as uh, creativity. You know, do you want to make his shirt whiter for the contrast? Do you want to make it darker? His garment. I mean, that's where you really have to give thought to what you want to do with the image. Okay. And that would be it. So you'll see, like, a lot of these images I, I do, it's only a few minutes. I rarely spend, rarely spend more than 10 minutes with an image. Uh, they're quick adjustments. Uh, I'm not big into spending, a lot of people like to spend a lot of time on their computer, I don't. I like taking photographs, so I like to spend a lot of time behind my camera and less time at the computer, more time with my kid, family. Um, so they're quick, these are quick adjustments that we make. Now this is just a classic shot, I mean it's a very cool dog. It's a, it's a, it's a classic shot um, of an image, I take black and white just for the obvious, you know, the contrast there. It's white, it's black. Um, and this was a, a dog at a storefront in Brussels. He kind of owned the place. Um, and so we'll start with this. What we're going to do, and we can think of this like a portrait, if you will, as well. Uh, we're going to convert this to uh, black and white, and I'm going to do that right here. So right off the bat, it looks pretty good. But what I want to do uh, is darken the background with him. So we're going to use simple dodge and burn techniques using the radio filter once again to achieve that. Now, one way that you could approach this is you could say, listen, I'm going to burn in the background by painting this whole area. And we use the brush here to do that. And that's right here. It's letter K on your keyboard. And you could, we could paint in, if you will, this area all around here to burn it in. And, and that's fine. It just takes a lot of time. And, uh, and I'm impatient, so I don't, I don't use that as often. Uh, but if you do decide to go that route, make sure you have auto mask on. It's going to help with edges and stuff when you're doing this. Uh, it'll make it, the job a lot easier. I'm going to delete this. And we're going to use a radial here. We're going to put it a bit like that, maybe. Let's see. This is the first time I'm processing it this way with you guys. So, And then we're going to make an exposure adjustment. So what we want, we don't want this inverted. We want it so it's affecting everything outside this area. And so we'll just make a simple exposure adjustment like that. 
See how it's dropping the background a little bit? It's also kind of creating, if you will, a vignette with him, but I'm, I'm okay with that. Now, if these lines are too harsh, what we can do um, is you can actually feather it differently. So that's with it blending right into the image. That's with it off. You can see that radio filter a lot easier now. See that? So the feathering, uh, by default, usually at 50. The other thing you can do is if an exposure adjustment doesn't quite work, what I like to use is obviously they're in the shadows, right? So we can use a shadow adjustment and just use that. See how it's darkening those, those other spots over here, that spot in here? A little more, we can just use a shadow adjustment. Like that. And then I'm going to create another, a new, so we're going to go new, create a new radio filter. I'm going to stack it on his face. that and I'm going to bring a little bit out of the shadows on his face just a little bit using the shadow slider and I'm going to add a little clarity to his face because actually it's not really sharpening but it, it's perceived like sharpening it's really not sharpening but it's adding that contrast that kind of gives that perception and then I am going to actually sharpen his face a little bit now let's take a look Pretty cool looking dog, right? Now, these lines here, if they bothered you, you could get rid of them. Um, I would recommend, this is the one area I do not like, Lightroom, is that when it comes time for any major surgery, as I say, you know, lines to remove or stuff like that, you could, I mean, you could burn this in maybe, or you could, probably the best thing to do is you take this into Photoshop and just remove it using Content Aware. It's a fabulous tool. Um, we could try it with, um, getting rid of it with just the heel tool like this and a lot smaller and you could kind of pull it and try to get rid of it but it, it's just kind of a I don't want to say sloppy because I love Adobe but the tool is not quite perfect okay I'm sure it's going to get better but that's a quick edit uh, for an image like this that was straight out of the camera um, I was shot so this shot was taken with uh, a Canon 2470, I think, and it had a graduated filter on it. And so that's why we have this already, this kind of nice darker sky. But I'm going to show you how I process this a little bit more. And we'll do this one in, in Lightroom. Originally for the book, which isn't here, my black and white book, we did a Nick. So I would start uh, first by probably doing an exposure adjustment here a little bit. Just bring it up a little bit. Not much. And then the first thing, how I do is I tackle images by what I see that I want to achieve. So I have already kind of a darker sky, but I'm going to drop a graduate filter on it to darken the sky a little bit more. And you'll see this little arrow up here. This is because I brought this in off my ELSA. This is from 2010. If you see that, that means update the process. Okay. Um, the process, for those of you who are not familiar with Lightroom, uh, down here underneath camera, I think it's a camera, isn't it? Yeah, the process. Uh, Adobe updates the algorithms that they use for processing images every so often. The last update they did is 2012. So generally speaking, you want to update to the latest one, but you want to take a look at what effect it has on your image. Uh, 2003, skip it. Nothing good came of 2003. <laughs> 2010's pretty cool. 2012, you know. Uh, but but it. So I would generally update, and we can see what the net effect is when I do that. You can come up here. Click it, sure, give me the update. Doesn't look like you did much. The histogram moved a little bit, you know. And if you ever want to go back, you're like, oh my god, why did I do that? You just go to the history and you can go back. You can see that's before the update. <laughs> so I'm gonna do a graduate filter here. I'm gonna close up this panel. Doesn't want to do that, does it? There we go. And so we're dropping a graduate filter down here. And you'll find these things move. They can get kind of crazy. If you hold the shift key and pull it down, I'll keep it nice and straight for you. And I'm going to do a simple exposure adjustment. Now, the story behind this are this is an ambicelli, and these elephants walk, um, walk to these marshes, and they soak in the afternoon, and they eat, and they drink. 
and we call this marching to the sun, this particular image. So I really want to control the light, if you will, uh, from the sunrise. So I'll move it a little bit to control that kind of flow and that line, if you will. I mean, not that much tilt. So we can do this through exposure. That's one option, right? Which we did, and I think right around there is fine. And the next place we're going to do this is we're going to go back down into the colors, and we can do this with the color as well. See how it makes it a little bit more dramatic? Probably somewhere in there. Now, these clouds, you can kind of see them here, will respond really well uh, to the clarity sl slider. Uh, but I don't want to apply clarity to everything here, so I'm going to pick and choose a little bit, if you will, the areas using the radio filter. So you find a theme. John likes the radio filter <laughs> a lot. I went to his workshop, and all he did was the radio filter. So see how that pops it? See that? Does a nice job. So I will go and pick and choose a little bit uh, which clouds I want to work with and do that versus applying that technique uh, to the entire uh, sky. Because, like I said, clarity, when you're using it, has a tendency of creating some noise along the way as well. So we do that with the sky. So here, uh, down below, I want to add some texture as well. So I'm going to take the, take the um, graduate filter again. Let me hit done first. And this time, I'm going to start from the bottom. We don't always have to come from the top. And we're going to come up from the bottom a little bit. Rotate it a little bit. And I'm going to add a little clarity here. See the difference in the texture? Do you see that? and add maybe a little bit of just contrast slider there because I like things a little darker. And lastly, for this image, what I'm going to do is th this particular um, elephant was really in, in, the, in the shade, if you will. So we'll grab, we can either, previous version back in 2010, I didn't have the ability to use the radio filter, so I just used a brush and I light them. In this case, I'd actually grab the radio filter once again put them right there, and just do a shadow adjustment. See how it's bringing out the shadows? Now, a lot of people will use exposure. I just want to show you kind of the subtleties here. We can do an exposure, and it might be fine, but see how, it, see how it's burning the background in quite a bit? I have found that when you're doing using the radio filter and you want to lighten something in the shadows, uh, it's not best to use the exposure. It's like a really blunt tool. Just use the shadow adjustments. See how he's coming out? And it's natural looking. There we go. We can move it around. And we do that here. But that kind of gives you an idea, if you will. Of where we've kind of come in the black and white. Skip ahead. I like this one, this mono lake. Uh, this one of those shots where you're on the road. I was driving to do, a, uh, to do a seminar, and I saw these clouds coming over mono lake and thought, what's this place? I'd never been there my entire life. I thought, well, I'll stop there. It's pretty cool, right? No tripod, no nothing, and I got the shot, and I, and I, and I love it. Um, so I'll do this one in Nick for you. We'll just use my Death Valley preset and call it a day. But sometimes presets do work. I mean, it, I mean, I hate to sound that way. People think that it's cheating, but uh, you know, it depends on the look you're going for. Like coffee has kind of a little um, warm tone to it. Dark skies manipulating the blues. Let's bring out the whites. We'll start with the highlight boost. Um, so the goal with this particular preset is really to make the whites pop. 
it's called the high, I call it the highlight boost. And it's, it's setting things to, like I said, so the whites really do pop here. And you can see that with the structure here too. See the structure slider? So this particular preset that I create is called the highlight boost, but it's really, see it's adding a lot to the clouds. I'm gonna dial it back a little bit for this image. And shadows I'm gonna bring down on this a little bit because I like it to be a little more dramatic. Anytime you have a very active sky too, so people ask, when do you go black and white? I have a tendency to go black and white all the time. Um, but when you have a really dynamic sky, I would say against the blue, those clouds really pop. It makes for a really nice black and white image. Um, and, the, and that's why I like, if we have a good, like I said, a good active sky, and that's what we call an active sky in this case. And you can see this has a very aggressive tone curve that's been set here. So we can move the sliders. We can make a few more adjustments with this. And then what I'd like to do is, with the control point, come down into the water here. And let's see what structure does. If it adds too much, see how it adds? That's a little too much for me. See how it's really making the reflection a little stronger? Um, which you may like that look, but not too much, but I can see a little better there. And we can duplicate this with a Command D and then move it around over here just to add a little more structure for the reflection. These are small, small moves. Now back here, it's a little dark. It's dark there, it's dark on, your, on my screen. So I'm going to create a little, another control point right here, and I'm just going to brain it up a little bit. Pulse, not that much, just very small moves, like I said. And I'm going to put this one over here. Now, if you have, and you can move them around, that's one of the techniques, like make the adjustment and move it around to see how it's affecting the tonal quality of the image so you can decide where you want to leave it. You don't just have to say, oh, I'm going to put it right there, I'm done. Move it around, make the adjustment, and move the control point around to see where you want to leave it. I'm going to leave mine right there. And you have two control points that are similar, doing similar things. You can group them together in, in Nick, which is really nice. <laughs> so we can select them both by going like that. That selects both. Um, and then we group them right here. This tool right here. Creates one master control point that controls both those areas. So now I can increase the brightness. See? Or decrease in that area. For those two. These work well in skies. They work well if you're doing someone's eyes. They're very effective for that as well. So if you have areas that you want to group control points, it's very handy. So we can kind of see how it was kind of very flat, much different image. And this is one of those deals uh, that I always tell people. It's how you visualize it. You know, you can create this image, do a lot of different things with this image, but that's kind of how I saw this shot. Let's save. Now, I'm going to do a shot. Someone asked about film, so I thought we'd do a film shot. Uh, they asked about scanning film in. A um, gentleman here did today. And this was, and I'm going to reset this. This was shot in Mexico not too long ago, just a little while ago. So this is pretty much straight, just scanned in right off the, out of the, out of the film. And there's subtle changes I would make here just to make this image a little better. One is, I would look for any spots. We get the dust, right? It just happens with film. And I know a lot of people aren't shooting film here, but if you are, some things that you can do. So off the bat, the first thing I do is I take care of all the spots. And so we, once again, we're here in the spot removal. It's right here, this tool. And then you come down to visualize spots. Kind of turns on what looks like a mask. And you can kind of move the slider around to help that out. And I'm going to get rid of all these little spots. And generally, this is where the tool in Lightroom does a really decent job. And then what you need to do is you need to turn it off, and you need to do a visual inspection. 
one to one is going to be too big here. Um, I scan these in really high res. So you want to do a visual inspection of the sky and make sure it's accurate. So that's one adjustment uh, there. The, <clears throat> the next would be to take a look at the same things when we're looking at our own images. Where are things uh, plugged up? How can we improve them? Well, this is a little dark for me right here. So once again, we're going to either, we can make a basic adjustment here with using the shadows. Bring it out like that. That actually does a pretty darn good job. Um, does a decent job. That would probably work. Or if you want to keep it a little more on the contrasty side, we could either use, use the brush tool. In this case, let's just do, I'm going to do a shadow adjustment and we could brush it in. And so this red here is the mask. It's this on right here to turn off. You go like that or you can hit the letter O on your keyboard. Um, and we'll have it off and we can kind of see the effect. See that? So we can brush it on. Or you can use my favorite tool, as I mentioned earlier, the radio filter, <laughs> which is actually how I did tackle this. Uh, we'll use a radio filter on him. And you'll see, just see the, the little change there. I don't want the water to have a glow. What I always avoid is you don't want the halo effect. See that? But just bring them a little bit out of the shadows. <laughs> like that, make the adjustment. So that's one thing I would do with this image is clean, it's clean up with the black and white image that you've scanned in. Uh, the other thing too that works very nicely uh, with your scans is that if you want to make your clouds pop, uh, it reacts very well with the highlight and what you need to do is use the brush and just take your highlights up just a little bit and you have to go in and paint each one a little bit, if you will. And I'll just kind of give you what it looks like. And you can make them a little brighter. See that, how they're brighter? I'll make that really bright for you. So you can make the clouds pop a little bit more, and it really helps. So those are the basic adjustments beyond just doing, if you want to do a, cone, uh, or do a uh, tone curve adjustment, like going to a medium contrast, working the, bringing up the whites maybe, and bring the shadows down, but that kind of, goes against what we were just doing. What I have found is when I scan my images in, they look pretty good. I just have to do clean up, what I would say, clean up with them. I, I get the question, why do you shoot with film? It's just different. It's a different process. I enjoy it. Um, and so, I mean, if you're going to shoot, do black and white. I always recommend doing some film as well. It's just a totally different process. Uh, this gentleman actually came right out of the camera, scanned in, and that was it. I was done. I didn't really do much. And you could add a little bit of contrast if we wanted to with him and we could do once again what I'd probably do here is a radio filter with him and then drop the background oops I need to invert it or that it is inverted turn that off there we go and just kind of create a little vignette maybe with him so that's an example there of what we would do uh, with film. So one last image, let's do this one from get start to finish. Okay, this is shot in Death Valley. We do a workshop there every year. And um, I like, like I said, we're there, we have to shoot. These are harsh situations at times. Um, you know, I was creating kind of this trying to create this big starburst here. And um, we'll convert this to black and white. And this is, um, right off here, you'll notice this Zimbriskie Point. It's a pretty famous area. Everyone, I'm sure people here in this group have shot this photo. Uh, but it's a little bit in the, in the shadows here. So we're going to make some adjustments. So I'm going to first start with this image by adding a little black. Then I'm going to go to the graduate filter, play with the sky a little bit, just exposure, darken a little bit, not too much. I'll head over to the color slider and work the blue. It's going to make a major effect. But the problem is that, like I said, I had a filter on with this image. So you watch, if you go crazy when you have a filter on, it creates kind of this weird 
weird look. So you can't you can't get too nuts with it. So we'll just darken it a little bit. But there's a lot of orange. See that? In the image? And if you're not sure, once again we can grab this tool, select the area, and let's just lighten it up a little bit. A lot of orange and red in Death Valley. Come to the tone curve. And I'm going to pop the darks a little bit. Because they're a little too dark for me. We got a medium contrast. I'm okay, I'm okay with that curve. What I want to fix is this. This is what's bugging me. It's too dark. It's in the dark. Kind of like me. So we'll just sit there and Grab a radio filter, put it on there. Pull the shadows out and watch. See how it's coming out of the shadows there a little bit? This may even be good for a little exposure adjustment. So it's looking good, but it's still it's still flat in the in the, in, in areas of it. So um, how I'm going to fix that is a foreground. I'm going to use the graduate filter again. I'm going to pull it up a little bit, and I'm going to add a little bit of just contrast using the slider. Now I'm hoping we'll see where we can use whites and blacks in the future sometime. But right now all I have is just the contrast slider. And I'll add a little clarity to pop the midtones because it's a very midtone shot. That's much better. And then lastly, uh, for this image, we'll sharpen it. Hit done. So I'm going to increase the sharpening. And I don't do as much masking. You'll find Lightroom's default for masking, actually, for landscapes is not that great. They, they kind of leave it where they're not masking anything off, but I do a little bit. And I'll increase a little bit. Right. Okay. So once again... Probably right around there. Um, I don't do, and I don't know about everyone here, I don't find that I need to do noise reduction very often any longer. Um, my cameras just, they perform really well with noise, but occasionally in the sky we'll have to do some noise reduction. But I don't, I don't have to use it that often. There are some low light shots that it does happen. I think that's it, right? We did okay? You got it? Oh. Thank you. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.